I'm going to start by uh, reading you an email that I received about 27 hours ago. And it was very appropriate, I thought, to I, I rearranged my talk because of it. So if you'd let me put on my glasses, because I'm old, um, or I just can't see. So, dear Mrs. Edwards, not Mrs., Ms., <laughs> Last year I attended one of your lectures at our school and you inspired me. As a young woman going into the game industry, it's amazing to see a powerful woman like you advocating for rights and doing the things you do. As you may have heard, in September and October, multiple controversies in our industry came up. And this is what I'm emailing you about. I hope that's okay. Within our school, we have a personal Slack channel that we use to discuss the things that are going on in the industry right now. In recently, the incidents like Telltale Games and Rockstar Games came up. And we've gone into a lot of discussion about this and about what we need to do within our school teams to minimize this behavior. In the Slack channel, I see a lot of things like, we need to unionize the gaming industry messages. And I see a lot of, we need to get out of this mindset. But it doesn't give me anything I feel any of us could possibly work with. They're just words. But to be honest with you, these incidents worry me. I'm concerned that when I come out of the university, I will be forced to work as many hours crunching as you see in these incidents. After all, these stories are not at all uncommon. I fear that while I love video games and I'm passionate about creating them, I will no longer be able to see my loved ones and I'll be forced at a company that enforces ridiculous working habits as part of their, quote, culture. As mentioned, I, we've discussed a lot with our school what we could do, but I'd like to ask you, what can we, the students of today and the developers of tomorrow, do against these practices? What steps can we take? What are ways are we, could we prevent this from happening? After all, we are the next generation of this industry. Is there anything that we can do? Right now, I'm mainly afraid of what future awaits me. That pisses me off. I hope it pisses you off too, because that is not the industry that I want to work in anymore. It's not the industry that I've been in, well, it actually is for 25 years, but this, things are supposed to get better. They're supposed to evolve. They're supposed to improve. So what can she do? How do we answer her question? What can you do to help her and to help yourselves? What can we do collectively to help each other? That's what I want to address today and talk about how can we be better advocates. Um, First of all, one of the things that we absolutely have to do is embrace our personal challenges as our crucible. Now, last year I gave this closing keynote at GCAP. Um, I got a lot of great feedback on that, which was super. That's primarily was the focus of that talk, was basically I kind of went through my own personal journey of embracing my adversity as a crucible, coming out the other side with a clear focus on who I, who I am and what I wanted to do to change things in this industry. I talked about, this is a little bit of a recap, if you weren't there, talked about like who are, who am I? I? All of us can put different labels on ourselves. We can look at ourselves through different uh, dimensions and whatnot. The geek part I demonstrated over and over again throughout my talk because it's just absolutely true. Um, I also talked about imposter syndrome last year because I felt this is such a fundamental thing that so many in this industry deal with as a roadblock, as, a, as an issue that stops us from being the advocates that we can be. Um, and it not only advocates in our, for our industry and profession, but even for ourselves as, as artists and programmers and writers and all the things that we're doing in our professional lives. So I use this example of the Matrix because the Matrix is one of the things that kind of broke me out of it because I was watching this in a symphony hall uh, during a concert and this part hit me super hard where Morpheus said to Neo, don't think you are, know you are. And it was that happened at a moment in my life where I was struggling very difficult, uh, very hard with this issue about why do I feel this trepidation every time I send emails to clients that I get all nervous. And, you know, even though at that point I'd been doing this work for almost 20 years, and yet I'm still unsure of my capability. But I realized at this time it kind of all came together thanks to Morpheus, that it was the disbelief in my own skills does not make them disappear. Um, it doesn't make them invisible to those around you. It's like, the, it's, I'm making them invisible to myself. I'm the one who's blocking that. I'm, not, I'm the one who's not embracing what I know. So you have to know that reality of what others see in you, even if you struggle to think you have the skills or not. And it's a real difficult uh, uh, phase or difficult process to get to that point, but nonetheless, it's critical for you and for all of us to kind of reach a point where we embrace what we know, uh, accept what we know, accept what we're able to do, 
and move on and do the best we can with that knowledge and with our skill sets. I also talked about such quotes like this, comparison is the death of joy. As I talk to developers all around the world, this is one of the number one things I hear them uh, express when they talk about imposter syndrome, and not only in their own professional lives, but also like in terms of uh, creating change in the industry, because they're like, well, I'll never be able to do it as well as they're doing, or I can never launch an effort like they're launching. And that comparison just co completely collapses their spirit of advocacy, and it's completely unnecessary. The comparison part, we have to really embody this in our thinking that it really is the death of joy. It, it destroys your motivation. It destroys your momentum to move forward and, and make change happen. So in other words, don't give a shit about whatever you, any, what anyone else is doing unless they're doing something that you think is you want to be a part of. That's great. Then join what they're doing. Um, so I talked about this, embracing your adversity as a crucible. It's basically a fire you have to go through as a forge. Um, I talked about the supreme ordeal. If you follow Joseph Campbell in The Power of Myth, he talks about every hero has to go through the supreme ordeal where they start out normal, then they go through this whole episode, and they come out the other side wearing spandex and have superpowers. Um, but I kind of see it that way because I am a geek and I love Marvel and all that kind of stuff. So I kind of see it is a form of embracing your superpowers because I believe that every single one of us have unique skills that nobody else has because nobody else has your life experience. No one has the context of your origin, your upbringing, all of these things which all inform your skill sets. It doesn't matter if you're in a room of 30 or 50 or 100 artists. Every single one of them is different. Um, I talked about how when I came out of this my friends actually noticed a difference in my attitude. They kept using this word fierce. You seem fierce now, uh, whereas before you were kind of more soft-spoken and quiet and didn't speak up much, and now you're just like, you won't shut up. And, um, and it's true, and that kind of came through in a lot of expressions. I kind of showed that even in my cosplay that I do with my daughter, it's kind of a, an expression of, of not necessarily just my geekness, although that's part of it, but it's also an embodiment and an external representation of how I now feel about myself. I feel kick-ass. I feel capable of, of making change happen. The other thing I talked about to some degree in that keynote was about the second point I want to make today is about making that conscious deliberate choice to advocate. It's one thing to rage, it's one thing to be angry and to identify things that need to change, but the next step is actually being a part of the change, making that, that, uh, that conscious choice. For me, it's because this phrase was echoing in my head um, for many years. Um, it's something we've all heard before, but for me, I really took it to heart. And I kind of reached a point during my own crucible phase where I came out of it saying, I am never going to be this person again. I am not going to let things just go by. I don't care what it is. I don't care if it's an injustice in our industry. I don't care if it's somebody on the street who's being, who's being robbed. I'm going to step in and try and stop it. Um, I'm not going to let things just happen. And, and turn a blind eye because that's why stuff keeps going on and on without change. And so that was a motivation for me. It's like, I, and yes, it sounds kind of heroic. I don't care. Some people think I have a superhero complex. That's fine. You know what? It works for me. And that's what's important. Um, I showed this slide last year because I, a lot of people responded to this image when I've talked to people who've seen this movie. And if you haven't, well, I'm going to spoil it for you. Too bad. But... Um, so many people, men and women, had a very emotional response to this one scene in the movie, which is this is where you see Wonder Woman basically for the first time in her full glory, stepping out of the trench in World War I and trying to stop a conflict that nobody else can stop. And so she, her, you know, her uh, partner that she's with, Steve Trevor, tells her, you know, we, we can't save any, everyone in this war. That's not what we came to do. But her response is, no, but it's what I'm going to do. And I think one of the reasons so many people had an emotional response to that is because for many of us, it is such an aspirational moment. It's like we wish we could be that person who has the courage to step out and to take action regardless of what's going on around us. And I think to this day, this, I, I think for a lot of people, that still is a motivating factor, but it's also a huge challenge. It's like to be, to reach that point where you have that degree of courage. You know, not only is she stepping out of the trench alone, but she's also wearing something that's pretty non sequitur for that time period, too. So it's even more, you know, like, wow. Um, I talked a lot about righteous rage, too. Um, I, we all have a certain amount of rage against things we see happening, whether it's politics or culture or social issues, whatever it might be. In our industry, 
you know, just if you were in the rant session, we are all ranting about something. We're all full of some form of rage, but I don't think it's enough to just be angry. You have to channel it. It can't just be raw anger that we see in social media a lot of times where people are just like, ah, you know, everything's, everything's bad, everything's terrible, I wish the world would change. It can, but we need to focus that anger. We have to focus that rage. And so for me, it's basically seeing it as a rebuke of injustice. It's not about just being angry because people crunch. It's being, I'm angry about it because it's wrong. It's a wrong practice. I don't think it's something that we should be doing. I get angry when publishers screw over indie developers with unfair contracts. I get angry when sexual harassment is reported in a, in a company and managers don't take it seriously. These things are wrong and they're always wrong to me. It's like, yes, I'm making a moral judgment here about what is right and wrong, and I, have, I make no apologies for that. Um, so where do we start with this? If we have this kind of righteous rage, we have this commitment, okay, fine, I wanna change, I, wanna, I want things to change, I wanna do something. So we have to keep focusing on the cause over the fear, because I know so many people are held back by that fear. Sometimes that fear is attached to the imposter syndrome issue, because they feel like I just don't have the skills, I'm not a speaker, I don't, you know, I'm an introvert, whatever it might be. Um, but a lot of times I've seen people, even the most introverted, closed people, open up and take action because they focus on that cause more than anything. They take the long-term view about this is what I want to change, this is my goal. Um, we want to be relentless against injustice that we see around us all the time and fervently support each other in this. This is what's super important. I, talked about this in the rant session just a bit ago about acting with collective will. This is actually, to me, one of the biggest foundations why things don't change in the industry. Because we all are complaining, we're showing our rage, and in some cases righteous rage, by taking action to try and stop things. But when we don't act collectively, it's a lot harder to make things happen. So I know you've heard this term before, the warrior poet. Um, it's, it's heard in literature a lot. Um, I think it's a great phrase. I love that contrast between being the fighter as well as the, the thinker. I think f what I suggest for our industry is what I call the creator advocate. So it's not just enough to be a creator of, of games, which is awesome in itself, but also an advocate on top of it. An advocate not only for yourself as, as your role in the game project or in the industry, but also as an advocate for your profession. So that's more of an external facing thing, which we'll talk about a little bit more. So, and it's just basically having it in your head as you're creating and as you're going about your business. I'm not saying you necessarily obsess on this every day, like I'm a creator advocate, I'm a creator advocate, as you're making artwork or writing or something. But you're keeping in mind that extra level, that kind of meta level, that what am I actually doing? Um, and one of the things I think that all creator advocates do, and they fully realize in the course of their work, is first of all, they embrace their role, which I think is very important for a lot of people in this industry to realize. And what I mean by that is that we, as game creators, represent the current evolution of human narrative. Here's just a simplified list of all these forms of media that have happened since the beginning of human history, and these are all forms in which narrative and storytelling have been passed down from generation to generation. And currently, games down here, we are that current form of evolution. You know, film is still around, a lot of these mediums are still around, of course, because they all have a certain way of so telling stories. Well, so do we. We have an interactive component to our storytelling that is more unique than any of these other forms. And so, we are currently defining how human beings pass stories onto one another. That's no small task. That's no small uh, you know, a mission that we have. And I think a lot of us, we may not wake up every morning and think about that, like I'm evolving human narrative today. Um, but that's essentially what we're doing. And I think it's important to realize that in the course of our work and kind of keep that in the back of our minds. The other thing too, I think, and a lot of us know this, I think already, whether it's uh, instinctually or just we know it blatantly, is embracing our influence as a medium. And so, just if you want to talk about the economic influence alone, here you go with uh, game, here's the revenue of games uh, compared to all these other forms of entertainment. This is all the revenue last year, this is in euros. Um, you see here different forms of media. And uh, we've already known, we hear it touted a lot that, well, games make more money than film and music combined. Well, it's, uh, we do. Um, so, but even books, hard copy books, the amazing thing that blows people away is when you think about all live sports, FIFA, NFL, 
baseball, all forms of life sports around the world, they're still less than video games. So we are a major fo economic force. We are a major uh, cultural force that is shaping how people view games uh, or basically how people view narrative. And so this is no small thing. I mean, when I've shown this chart and when I've talked to people in the public about it, they cannot believe it. And they say, well, I think games make a lot of money, but they have no idea because they hear about films. They'll hear about the opening weekend for Avengers Infinity War makes all this money, but then they rarely hear that, well, Grand Theft Auto V made a billion dollars in a week. Um, you know, and it, since its inception, it's made a ridiculous amount of money because um, it has a very long tail. Now, imagine yourselves in this mirror Whatever you might see there, I don't know what you see. What I see is basically a room that looks like this. Um, yes, I have active imagination. But um, honestly, I think every one of us has a certain skill set and a certain talent that we bring to this industry that is wholly unique. Um, and we have to find ways to leverage that. That is, we, we already are bringing it to the industry as creators and as contributors to the art form of games, but it's that other part about how do we become an advocate? What do we actually do with our superpowers to take them to the next level and actually push forward the conversation about games as an art form, games as a medium, and games as a workplace and what we need to do here? Um, so another thing that I encourage people to do, which I did for myself, is create a personal advocacy strategy. So you want to be an advocate. Great. So you, you're committed. I want to do something about this thing that's happening over here. So you have to first figure out, okay, what exactly are you going to do? Where are you going to start? So I remember last year I was on the stage here at the closing keynote, and I said, I'm going to make a website, gameadvocacy.org. Well, guess what? I made one. So I've got a website that I started after the, after the event last year. Um, basically, this is just my personal expression of my form of advocacy. I have a front page, which is not a big surprise. Um, I talk about initiatives and other things as well. It's a pretty simple website. It's not, you know, it's not that complicated, but it's my way of at least putting a footprint saying, okay, here you go. Now the world can see this is exactly what I stand for. And I encourage people to decide, basically, what does it look like for you? It doesn't have to be a website or anything like that. It could just be like a, a, a post-it pad that says, I want to do one, two, and three. These are the things I really want to accomplish. Whatever it might be, do what you need to do. The other thing is focus on the issues that define your righteous rage. It could be one issue. It could be many issues. But I think it's super important to really be introspective and think about what is that thing that's really making you so pissed off or you're so passionate about that you want to see this change um, in the industry. It could be something hyper-local. It could be something in your school, in your company. It could be the relationship between you and a manager. It could be something in your local community that you're not, that you don't think is going well. Whatever it might be, um, you basically have to focus on it and define what that might be. In my case, I came up with these, uh, this list of initiatives that I put on my page because after I was thinking about it, what are the core things that are really making me angry about this industry? Well, I defined it as four different points. One is about perception. So I really don't like the way our industry is perceived by the public. I always thought that trade associations and other associations, that was their job to better promote us to the public. Well, guess what? They don't. Um, they really are not doing a very good job of, to the actual uh, public out there. To the game playing public, it doesn't really matter as much. They're already embracing what we do. But I'm talking more about like the unintended audience, all of the people who make judgments about what we are and who we are as, as creators. The other thing is about wellness, about valuing people over profits. This has certainly been a theme in, in a lot of the local stories, like some of the ones I showed earlier. Um, this is wellness, mental wellness, physical wellness, all forms of wellness around uh, people. This includes not crunching. This includes all of that kind of category. So this is another area where I think is very important that I want to see improved. The other one is about inclusion, is that we have to make sure that those who create games better reflect those who play them. Because we already know that games are a ubiquitous art form and form of entertainment that's played by pretty much every demographic around the world. But we do not represent a lot of that demographic. We are still very skewed gender-wise, racially, and so on uh, in terms of who's actually making the games. And I know there's been a lot of discussion around this, and I think we can still do a lot better <clears throat> in improving this. And the fourth one is, is, is fairness. And this is kind of a broader category, but I think I see a lot of unfairness and mistreatment in this industry, and I think a lot of it is based on people just simply not respecting each other as professional, creative people, and as human beings. 
Um, a lot of behaviors from management to, to employees, a lot of behavior between employees. It's just, why can't we just be nice to each other? <laughs> you know, it's just like, it's, it's, it's that simple, really. Why can we not at least, you know, take on a, 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 a form of civil discourse when we disagree with each other instead of like, you know what, I don't like what you're doing. I'm going to go on Twitter and, and yell at you on Twitter about it and get all my friends on Twitter to yell at you too. It's like, what the fuck? Really? It's like, is that where, where we've resorted to? That social media is our crutch? That we can't just go talk to somebody face to face? I mean, I see this stuff happening all the time. It's like we can just treat each other with a sense of fairness and not necessarily, you know, feed them to the dogs of social media. Um, comment, is, that's uh, editorial aside. Um, another thing, too, is design a, define a specific action you can take and then do it. And I mean now. Do it now. Don't wait. Don't, you know, say, so, well, I'll do that next month when I've got time. You're not going to have time. I didn't have time to do any of this. I just did it, you know, as I could. So in my case, one of the things I did um, following GCAP last year, one of the things that was kind of burning in the back of my mind, there's all kinds of issues related to those four areas. But one of the areas that I was really focusing on was inclusion, basically a, a combination of inclusion and fairness. And this is the issue of ageism in our industry. There's been a lot of discussion around sexism, which we've had volumes of discussions about, which I think we, we need, that certainly needs to continue. But ageism is another very serious issue in our industry. So I decided, you know what? I'm going to, um, one of the things that was kind of burning with me, we have all of these 30 under 30 lists, which don't get me wrong, I think that's great. I love recognizing talent, especially upcoming talent. I think it's important to do that. But what about the talent that's already here? What about the veterans who've been in this industry for a long time? And so I created the 50 over 50 list, which I thought surely somebody had done this before, but nobody did. So to my surprise, um, it was a simple thing to do. I basically created a Google form with questions uh, for nominating people. I put it out there to my community on social media and elsewhere and basically said, hey, I'm looking for nominations for people who are over 50 years old who are still actively involved in game, de game development. Throw, give me some names, you know, tell me, you know, they basically give me a name, give me basically a little bio, like, who is this person, what have they done? And so for six weeks, I had this up. I kept reminding people every week, hey, vote, you know, sub, uh, submit names, all this kind of stuff. After six weeks, I had this massive list. I had over 200 nominations of different people from all around the world. And so then I did a simple metric. I basically just put them in an Excel spreadsheet, rank them by the number of votes that they got, cut it off at 50 people, I'm done. That's it. I made a list. And so I put the list together, and uh, then I went basically broadcasted, hey, there's a 50 over 50 list. I originally wanted to do this by GDC, but actually I was delayed because I'm busy, so I did it at E3. So the first day of E3, June 11, is when I announced my list. I said, here you go. Now, because of the connections I've had, like in my days running the IGDA, I have connections to the media, so I just kind of blind broadcast for, through one email to my media contact saying, hey, if you're interested, I just made this list. You know, if, if you think that's interesting, hit me up. Otherwise, whatever, I'm moving on. Um, and every one of these, you click on it, it has just like a little, um, it has a link to their LinkedIn profile. So, um, but that's it. And so there was a lot of great dialogue that was going on at the time about ageism. And, and some people were like, wow, I didn't realize that person was still working in games. I didn't know that that person was even in games, <laughs> it's, which is kind of weird. Um, but a, a lot of these names, you go down the list, amazing uh, people. You know, there's a lot of familiar names, Brenda, Brian Fargo, I mean, you know, Don Daglow, Ed Freeze, all of these people over and over. Um, a lot of well-known people. There's a lot of people in this list that not a lot of people know about, um, but they might be educators or they're in other roles um, where they've touched a lot of lives because they've been working on the education side, which I consider to be part of game development. Education is certainly part of the ecosystem of game development. And so it was great to get this kind of feedback and to elevate this issue and, see, and to see it roll onward. And I did get some criticism about this list, and I think the criticism was fair. Like, um, I couldn't believe it got in variety. That was the part that blew me away. Um, so like when I had some people on the back channel emailing me saying, why am I not on this list? Yeah. You know, don't you know who I am? And they like sent me their, uh, literally sent me their CV. And they're like, you know, I'm famous. I'm, you know, I said, yeah, but it's just, it was based on nominations. I didn't, you know, you were in the list, but you didn't make the cutoff. That was the key. 
And um, they were a little upset by that. But, um, and I made very clear on the website, it's not curated, it's a simple nomination process with a cutoff. That's all I did. I didn't try and curate the list necessarily. Um, I was glad to see that out of 50 people, I believe there was 14 women who were on that list, which is, that's pretty good. I was pretty happy with that. Um, so, um, yeah, so it, it got some good feedback. There were a lot of good discussions. It kind of spiked the conversation about ageism, and now we're back down into whatever. We're just heads down doing our thing again. Um, there are some follow-up things I'm going to be doing with this because I got some great ideas from people. Like, for example, one person gave me feedback, and they said, don't you think that... Um, because some of the people in that list, they are working in education. They're actually not in a game studio. And so some people are saying, don't you think that the reason they're in education is because their age is preventing them from getting a job in a game studio? That's a great question to ask. That's going to be another survey I'm going to do soon to ask people who are in this age group, do you think, you know, have you had barriers to getting an actual job in a game studio to your, because of your age? Do you think that's been a problem? Um, Although it's natural that in any industry you tend to have older workers do gravitate more to the education side because they take on a more mentorship teacher role, which is completely appropriate. Um, but in some cases, there are people who would like to still actively be in, employed in a game studio and they do find it difficult to get a job because of their age. And I know many people who've had this problem. The other thing too is align yourself with like-minded people and act collectively. Because obviously for a lot of these issues, whatever issue it is that's burning you, it's very unlikely that you are the only person who is, has that issue um, on, that you're on fire about. There is very, it, there's a lot of people around you, even if it's a local issue, you know there's gonna be people who probably share your opinion. So try and seek them out and work together because that's really how you can make change happen. So Collective action does occur when people work together to achieve a common objective. We see it all the time. It, there are great examples of this happening in politics and, and culture and all these other uh, arenas, but it has been recognized that all individuals often fail to get to work together well to achieve the common goal. This is one of the reasons why I think we have not seen unions form in the game industry after all of these years and decades of having these same practices affect uh, game developers' lives, but it's, we've been very slow to unionize. But you know what? If you look back at the history of Hollywood, which is heavily unionized now, they had the same issue. They, in the early days of Hollywood, they, basically that's where I see the game industry right now. We are kind of where the, game, where the film industry was in the 30s and 40s, where basically the studios had absolute power over talent. They were the ones who controlled. The studio told you what film you're working on, whether or not you're starring in that film and whatnot. And then there was this shift that happened with the rise of unions and basically the rise of talent. And so the power dynamic shifted in Hollywood. So now who's in charge? The stars, the directors, the people who actually are making this stuff, the power shifted in their direction. And so that's basically a lot of how Hollywood is run now, although it's more of a kind of a push and pull, but at least there's a little more equity than there was in the early days of Hollywood. And I kind of see that's where we are in the game industry now. And it, it stands to wonder where we're gonna end up if we're in the equivalent of the 1930s and 40s for the game industry right now. But there are efforts that have been started up. Um, you know, so since um, I brought this up last year, but then Game Workers Unite, they emerged at GDC this year and made a big splash there, and they've been making a lot of comments and, and a lot of uh, effect in the community. They've started chapters all over the world, including here in Australia, and what their goal is is to basically inform people about the idea of collective uh, working together collectively and, per, you know, per, uh, potentially forming a union or, perf or actually creating some kind of leverage that's going to help each other out um, and formal leverage. Last year in France, the STJV started, which is a small union in France. And so the effort is starting to move forward. A lot of people feel that that kind of leverage is necessary in our industry to counteract a lot of the injustices that we've been seeing um, lately. And I do think there's a lot of value in that. And I think that is definitely a solution that we need to explore. Um, I might, and like there was even someone yesterday who was walking around handing these out here at GCAP. And uh, yeah, there he is right there. And I thought well, that was awesome. And, um, and you even said you just, you just recently got involved with them, which I thought was cool. So, um, so the other thing, too, is defining your scope and then adhere, uh, adhering to it. Don't Try not to let yourself get fragmented because this is one of the areas where I see so many people who want to advocate and want to uh, create some kind of change, 
they pick something like, I'm going to deal with this, but then something else pops up, a news story or something like, oh, that's even worse. I want to deal with that instead. Try and focus on the thing that really is burning you, that, that focus of your righteous rage, like I said, and you really have to try and stick to it and see it through to, uh, see it through to its logical conclusion as best as you can. If you get fragmented, then the effort's just going to keep falling apart, and you're never really going to reach some kind of level of critical mass. Um, there's a lot of fantastic efforts that have been started in the game industry by one person who had that righteous rage about a certain issue, like Lila, who started Girls Make Games. She said, more girls need to be making games. We need to see uh, better inclusion in our industry. We need to start by teaching girls how to make games. And I thought that's a, that's a great way to start because we need to start early. And so, you know, basically we can build that pipeline. Um, we have uh, Mark who's here. He's visiting out there somewhere um, who started Able Gamers. Um, this is a fantastic organization that focuses on people with disabilities. And so basically his, his mission was that people who have physical disabilities should be able to play games. They should be fully capable of enjoying the art form that we create. And so his whole mission has been focused on making that happen, not only helping the people um, who have disabilities, but really helping educate game developers about what they can do to make their games accessible. And I think this is just an awesome, um, an awesome effort. And then there's things like Take This that focus on mental health in both the game industry and on the consumer side. We're focused on the mental wellness of people. This is critically important. It's one of the core problems I've seen when I talk to developers worldwide is when they express some of the impacts that on their lives because of some of the practices in our industry, it's, it's, there's almost always a mental health dimension to it. And so we have to focus on this. I'm not, you know, I, I know that in the U.S. at least, the, the stigma against discussing mental health is enormous um, because it's always seen as a weakness. Um, and we're getting a little bit better, but we, we, we might need to go through about 50 more celebrities committing suicide before people really get the message. But honestly, um, I'm doubtful because um, we have other issues going on. We've, I'm not going to make a political commentary now. Uh, anyway, and then myself. So one of the things that I'm starting um, that I feel that is necessary as a form of leverage in the industry is I'm starting a legal defense fund for game developers um, because I feel that this is one way that we can give developers leverage that will be pretty universal. Um, so like if you're an uh, indie dev who needs advice on whether or not to sign a contract with a publisher, you would have a place to go and get it reviewed and say, okay, now I understand what this is all about. Um, if you're in a company being harassed and your management's not taking you seriously, um, you have somewhere to go. And, and ask them, what are, what's my former recourse? Because I can't get management to listen to me to take action against this douchebag over here. Um, there's a lot of ways that I think a legal defense fund can be leveraged. Um, the comic book industry has one. Actually, one of the people who is um, helping me with this is one of the people who created the, the legal defense fund in the comic book industry many years ago. Um, now, the comic book industry's legal defense fund was orig originally created to stave off censorship because there was a huge movement, especially in the 50s and 60s, to censor comic books um, for all kinds of reasons. And so, um, so I'm doing this basically because I think there's a whole host of issues that need our help um, in, in order to address. So the other thing, too, is think about that not, not all actions have to be big and, and audacious. You don't have to create an organization. You don't have to create a legal defense fund. You don't have to do all of that stuff. Honestly, most of us aren't suited for that because we're just we're just so busy doing what we do and, and doing what we love, but you still want to do something. And so I think some of the things we can do are super easy and super simple, and I wish more developers would do this. For example, demand fairness in media coverage. So you constantly see stories. These are from newspapers, which are becoming quickly irrelevant, but we still have, you know, uh, news websites. But whenever something happens with violence, especially, um, you know, well, it happens all over the world, but if there's, if there's violence, then games are blamed. And it's like, why are developers not speaking up? Why are they not writing editorials and contacting the media sources saying, this is total bullshit. There's no research to support this. Why do you keep perpetuating this crap? And uh, we just don't see enough developers doing that because we're just, we're all heads down. Yeah, that's, yeah, whatever. They're just, but we can't have that attitude. We, if we want it to change, we have to speak up and say something. That could be so easy to even have a form email ready so that if this happens in your local news, you could just fire it off, you know, customize it slightly and fire it off and say, this is wrong. Um, you know, this, your information is incorrect and I'm here to help educate you. And of course, we do it nicely and diplomatically. We don't necessarily have to rage at them because then they, they won't listen, but we need to do it. Um, 
We also had to think about pushing for equal time in mainstream media. This is, this is slowly changing, but we see a lot of news sources which focus so much on other forms of media with book reviews and movie reviews and all that kind of stuff, and they kind of get all the glory. It's like, what about the game reviews? Why are we not next to all of these things? I mean, there's more people consuming us than these things, okay? So it's like, why are we not getting the same kind of attention and time in media as some of these other art forms? And it's one of the things, again, we should push for that. Um, we also have to be relentless against mis misinformation. This is, again, is a very easy thing for anybody to do at any, at any time. So, for example, in the U.S., they did a study a few years ago um, where adults in the U.S. that were 40% believe there's a relationship between games and violence. Even though the, the Supreme Court of the United States in 2011, when they ruled that games are free speech, which is a major victory for, um, for people in the U.S., even the Supreme Court of the United States, they said there's no connection between games and violence. And yet, you know, the, the mass, most of the public still believe this. 26% thinks games are a waste of time. 60% um, believe that most of the people who play games are men. We know that's not true. Um, and this one is hilarious. 23% think most video games do not promote teamwork and communication. They obviously have not played a game in the last like 10 years. Um, they've obviously never heard of things like Fortnite or any of these other games um, because it's one of the things that a lot of the games today do especially well about promoting teamwork and the need to communicate in order to achieve your goal. I mean, some of the basic statistics that we know in the industry are things that the public constantly get wrong. When I engage with the public, when I engage with government officials, and I keep hearing them not understanding, this, these stats right here completely blow away most of the people I talk with in the public. When I tell them that there are more women in the 30 to 40 something age range who play games than boys below 18, they tell me, you're full of shit, I don't believe it. But that's the statistic. That's what we know. That's our that's our industry data. It's like, and they just, but they don't believe it. They're like, that can't be true because I know that most gamers are in their mom's basement playing games, which is, you know, there's a whole ridiculous stereotype, but it keeps getting perpetuated over and over again. And I don't see associations stepping up and correcting this at every turn like they should be. And that really uh, frustrates me. And I think it's our job as the people actually doing the work who need to step up and do that. And the other thing that I think is critically important, one of the most important things that every single one of us can do, and again, it's super easy for us to do, is open the black box of game creation. It doesn't matter if you're a student or an indie or at a big studio, whatever the case may be, you have the power to educate anybody around you who's not involved in games. Now, this is the typical chart of what the, a typical game uh, development ecosystem looks like in any locale where you've got the education component, you've got the game creators, and then you have the government. So these are the fundamental components of an ecosystem. And of course, the public is there as well. Um, one of the areas where, and you know, we have all these special relationships that happen between all these segments, and the public, though, in my view, is often just assumed as being there. Well, they're the people who buy our games. And that's what they do. They buy our games, and that's how we get paid and, and have a living and everything. But I think we need to do a much better job of actually engaging that public directly. Don't rely on associations or whoever to do it. We, as developers, engage the public. And I think we can influence public opinion by be opening up. Like, this is who we are. This is what we do. Now, to illustrate this, I, I know a story. Like, in Gamescom this year, I had a Canadian colleague tell me that um, one of the things that they did is, is I often encourage studios to do, or even small indie studios, that, and why don't you invite, uh, have an open house where the public can come in and see what you do? Because a lot of people understand how films get made, for example, because there's even tons of films about making film. They get it, they understand it, but many people have no idea how games are made. We're a black box to them. You know, basically a lot of them even assume, as I've talked with people, that we sit around consciously just thinking, I wonder how violent we can get away with this game. You know, it's like, now, yeah, some games, you do that. I worked on all the Dead Rising games, and that's exactly what we did, but that was kind of the point of the games. Um, but one story that I was told at Gamescom from a Canadian colleague, they said in the province that they're in, they had a, one, a member of parliament who was very anti-game, like fiercely anti-game. So they uh, extended the olive branch, 
they invited him to come to the studio, and so he came there for like half a day. He, he got to meet all the people there, saw they were nice people. Um, they have families. They, they, they pay their taxes, you know, all that kind of stuff. Um, they, they, show, they had him sit down and actually use like ZBrush and take a look at Unity and play their games, you know, and, and, and to his credit, the, the MP was open to doing this. At the end of the day, one day, they turned this guy 180 degrees. He walks away out of there saying, you know what, I need to support you guys. This is, a, this is a going concern. This is a technology company that's making this amazing stuff. You've got really cool people working here. I need to help you. One day, now that's not typical, obviously. I mean, usually it takes a long time and a bit of you know, needles under the fingernail torture of politicians to make that happen. But, um, but it's amazing that it can happen. You know, that you can actually have that kind of influence and all, you had to, all they had to do was just reach out and be the ones who took the high road and said, I'm, we actually are going to help educate you on this. Um, the other thing too is we have to pace ourselves and enjoy every little incremental victory that we have because obviously if you're trying to change like an entire industry or like some large issue locally, you're, it's not going to happen overnight. Um, even with that story I just told, the, oh, okay, great, they got one MP to be on their side. It's a start. That's a huge victory. It's an incremental victory that they need to celebrate and then foster that relationship with him. It's maybe he can help convince other politicians in that area to support the game industry as well. Um, because I think one of the things that we have to do is really remind ourselves that our goal is not to change the world as a creator advocate. I know that's basically the, the foundation of how we get started is at, with advocacy. It's like, I'm going to fix this, I'm going to change this, everything's going to be different. It will be someday, but your job basically really is to change only your small piece of it. So if you identify that piece that you want to change, no matter how small it is, and you make an, a real concerted effort to do it, I think when we work all, we're, if we're all doing that at the same time, collectively, we will change everything. I'm fully convinced of that. I've seen it happen in other industries. I know it can happen in ours. Um, and so, you know, it basically relies on every one of us to make that conscious decision to step up and, and take that role and just, as a creator advocate and decide what am I actually going to do to make life better, not just for yourself, but more importantly, for everybody around you. I don't want to see this kind of statement made ever, anymore. I don't want to see, see an email like this ever again. I know I'm going to get more like this. I get emails like this every once in a while, but this is the last thing I want to see. And I think for a lot of us, we do not want to see students and young people who are so aspiring to go into this industry and to be, you know, be the future of this industry, to be walking into it with, with that kind of attitude. And so I'm hoping that all of us can work together to make that change. So. Um, there you go. That's it. And there is some time for questions if you have questions. Thank you. Are there any questions, comments? That's perfectly fine. Yes. Yeah. Um, not quite sure how to bring that up as well without feeling like my job is here. Yeah. Well, that honestly, that's part of the choice that every one of us has to make. Um, it's not an easy choice. Um, I've advised a lot of students that when they go in for a job interview, that they need to raise the question. You know, what what are your diversity numbers like? How often do you crunch? Um, you know, basically, what does work life balance look like here? Um, and especially if the student, if they've done their homework and they hear that there's actually some negative stories about the company, they should bring them up in the interview. And they say, well, I might not get my job if I, if I do, if I bring it up. It's like, but if you, but do you want to work at that company then? It's like, well, I want my dream job. It's like, is that a dream job? You know, and it's, it's a really tough choice. And I think it's difficult because I think right now we live in an age where, we have to make those choices and because ultimately the company has to be sent a message. And I think if they're hearing from incoming talent especially that I am not willing to work under those conditions, I can guarantee you that HR people, they, they take that back to management and say, look, I'm hearing a lot from, from prospective talent that they're, they're hearing about our work culture here and they're not so happy about it. Now, if the management is shitty and they'll say, well, fuck them, we'll just find other people who don't care. And they will. You know they will. They'll find somebody. 
Um, but I think that message has to be reinforced one way or another. And, um, but that comes down to a very personal decision, you know, do I want to take that stand? And it, I know how absolutely difficult that is, you know, because you want the job. I mean, you want, you want to have a job, you want to work in the game industry. Um, the other way to do it is you have a conscious decision, okay, I'm going to take this job, but once I'm inside the company, then I'm going to raise hell. Now, that's, that's what I did at Microsoft. I, I never intended to work at Microsoft because I saw them as the evil empire when I was back in college. So, but I ended up working there for 13 years. But once I was inside the company, I noticed things that needed to be changed. And so I found that if you are inside the company, you are, it's, well, it's, it's to use the viral analogy, a virus has much more success when it's actually inside the body. So you got to get inside first and then you can infect. You know, trying to get in is the hard part. So oftentimes I've suggested to people that if you're willing to do that and kind of in the same tone, have that creator advocate's mindset. It's like, okay, I'm going to go into this company wide-eyed. I know what I'm getting into, but as I'm there, I'm going to try and change things. Now, I might end up losing my job over it because I keep raising hell about it, but that's a risk you're going to have to take if you're willing to take that risk. But I'm, honestly, I think if people, that's one of the reasons things haven't changed is because people don't do it. And um, I realize it's, it's sacrificial. I totally get that. And not everyone is in a posi position to do that, and I can appreciate that. But for those who might be in a position to do it, I recommend that they, they make the attempt. You know, get inside, raise hell, or, or even if they're willing to just, you know, go interview at a company you don't want to work for, but you know their culture might be shitty, so you go to the interview anyway, and then go to the interview for the sake of making a point. Now, that's kind of wasting their time, but, you know... It's like, they, it's, it, it's a little bit subversive, but that's fine with me. I have no problem with that. Mm -hmm. um, but I think it's important that actions like that have to be taken. And, and it's, that's why I mean collectively. Imagine if, imagine if everyone who was interviewing for the same job at the same company were, was sending the same message to the people, to the management when they're going in for the interview. Like everyone's asking those same questions. I can guarantee you they would be taking notice of it. And now, you know, they might think there's a conspiracy, and maybe there is, but, <laughs> but that's, that's fine. Then if, if they're worried that there's a conspiracy to undermine the company, then they should, then I'm glad they're worried. Um, so I know it's, it's not an easy issue. It's not an easy answer. Um, and that's where it really kind of, you have to dig deep, like, okay, well, how much, how much am I really into this advocacy stuff? How much am I really want to, you know, do I want to stake my career and put it on the sacrificial pyre to try and forward the, 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 uh, the mission or forward the goal. Um, some people are willing to do that and some people I completely understand don't. And that's where we have to kind of really be introspective about what our comfort level is at doing that. So it's no easy answer. I wish I had an easy answer for that. Yes? Um, as well, I just want to do a bit of plug. We have the Arts Law Centre in Australia. They yes. Do, it's a not-for-profit. Um, so if you've got any kind of legal questions, highly recommend yes. you Yes. Um, is there something that you can see? Uh, I really took to heart the idea of just focusing on one thing that might be useful. Mm -hmm. uh, is there um, one thing that you can see in Melbourne or Australia here that you think the people in this room might be able to try to focus on? And concentrate on? Well, I mean, I can only conjecture because you know your community far better than I do. I mean, I, this is only my third time here, and I love this community, and I love this week, but my sense of community, um, the, the thing I hear the most here is about the political engagement, not necessarily in, in Victoria, because obviously I think you've had a lot of support from Film Victoria and Creative Victoria and whatnot, but from the national government, which has had some of the same problems we have. <laughs> um, and I think that level of engagement, is that's often the complaint I hear from developers here, um, about you know that that our government just doesn't get it at all. I know a few what was a couple years ago or so they withdrew funding. They had a, a indie fund which they withdrew, but I think they partially restored it to my knowledge. No, no they didn't. Okay, well then fuck them. So, um, <laughs> but I was going to say something nice about them, but <laughs> but that um, so that to me that that's often the complaint I hear. Um, of course, that's a national level thing, um, but you, I can guarantee you might have more traction than I would at the national level right now, because <laughs> I won't get any traction at all. Um, yeah, 
So, um, but yeah, I think that's really something that you have to define because I, I don't really know. But that to me is what is the number one complaint I hear. Um, and it's not an uncommon complaint at all. I mean, I was just in Iran three months ago and you know, the, the, the joy of being in Iran was that the developers there, they, you know, they expressed all of the same frustrations all of us express anywhere else. Discoverability of my game, um, you know, the, the lack of engagement um, uh, from the, the government. Although at the conference I was at, the Minister, ministry, uh, minister of Culture was there and the mayor of Tehran, who's a woman, she was there, which was awesome. Um, but yeah, they, they express all the same frustrations. So it's just in their case, their biggest issue is that because of economic sanctions, they actually cannot get their games out and they can't get money in. I mean, one small uh, indie company in, in Iran, they have to funnel their money to Austria, then to Oman, and then to Iran, which, you know, at every stage, the, uh, t a cut gets taken out. But anyway, that's a tangent. So, okay, five more minutes. Any more questions or comments? Going once, going twice. All right, thank you very much.